Okay. All right. Right. Okay. Um. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Um. Can't really see everybody that's here right now, but um. Hi, and welcome to our first um Design SG event. It's a designers ask me anything. Um. So we'll do a quick. Uh, introduction of the Design SG group, and that will be done by our co-founder Sid. Um, yeah, take it away, Sid. Sid is on mute. Sid, you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, hi, hi everyone. I'm Sid. So Design SG started about six months back uh, in a message post on our sibling group, which is called DevSG for developers in Singapore. So someone just posted, uh, is there a design group here? So a couple of us just saw a need and filled a need through a Telegram group. And uh, we, were, we were very lucky to meet in person uh, just before DorsCon Orange kicked in. And after that, the group has grown to about 600 members in the first six months. We were planning this event to celebrate 500 members, but here we are. So, so yeah, that's uh, pretty much about the group. It's comprised of designers of all kinds in Singapore. And there are uh, people and discussing all kinds of things like job description like sharing job experiences job listings and their experiences as a designer and sharing interesting links and so on so this is our first live event so we are very excited to have all of you here and we'll have another event maybe before we hit 1000 so yeah, over to you, man. Thanks, Sid. Um, yeah, so uh, it was really cool meeting Sid and starting this, and we definitely never had to go this quickly. Um, we're we're probably about we're just about to hit six hundred members. So yeah, that has been quite an amazing journey in just a short six months. Um, yeah, so uh, a bit about me. Um, I'm actually um from. Um, industrial design um, background. So I attended a Scuola Polytechnica um, together with one of the panelists, Postami. Yeah, and uh, um, so today we're really happy to have all our panelists and especially thanks to Kiat for agreeing to moderate this session. So I'm going to hand over the time to Kiat right now. Oh, okay. Uh, I hope you all can see my screen and happy National Day post-national day to everyone. Uh, I'm Kiet. I'm also uh, probably serving in the community, the design community since about 2011 uh, through IXDA, which is uh, Interaction Design Association. Uh, and today really happy to help me and sit to sort of moderate this uh, conversation, right? Um, let me just introduce to you the rest of the panelists. So other than myself, which is doing the moderation, I think I want to introduce uh, Mostami. So Mostami, you are based in Cyberjaya, right? Yes. So yeah. yeah, our friends from the other side. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Mostami is also the founder of ArtWiz. Uh, did I pronounce it correctly? Or? Uh, yeah, Art ArtWiz. Art Twist, yeah, yeah, a bespoke watch design company that collaborates with global brands. Um, he is also a design maestro, and he has just actually worked at Lamborghini. Um, no, I have to clarify here that I I I'm not a staff in Lamborghini. Uh -huh. But then, uh, how did my experience comes in? It happened way back in two thousand um, eight. Uh, during that time, uh, it was before that I was in the selection of the Malaysian first astronaut. Uh, and from 12,000, then I managed to become the final eight. And um, they say the rest is history, but then my history is that I didn't get selected to be the only one. So it, it's kind of frustrated. But then um, uh, for me personally, I always like uh, when, when you had such a failure in, in any kind of ventures, uh, the only thing that comes to yourself is that how you, how you can get picked up 
or how you get back to your own toes uh, quickly, right? So I was into the the design world, car design and kind of stuff uh, for since I was a kid. That was my passion. And um, during that time, um, I believe all of you know uh, Lamborghini, right? The, the supercar brand from Italy. And during that time, uh, this uh, there was like a, a worldwide uh, announcement, official announcement by the company itself that <clears throat> they are looking for a young designer to come to Italy and to help them uh, to design like the future DNAs of Lamborghini. So um, the, the term was like, uh, they are looking to collaborate with this young designer at this place, which is Scuola Politinga de Design, whereby at the end of the courses, um, we will be awarded by a master's in car and design. So basically, it was like a, a, a program by this university, collaboration with the Lamborghini, but then Lamborghini gives scholarship to certain students. So uh, long story short, I was the one of the students who get the scholarship from them. That, that's how my experience with Lamborghini for, I think, for almost like one and a half years, more or less, yeah. Awesome. So, most time into this panel. All right, next up we have Kenny. Kenny has been, uh, I've, I've been to one of the talks by Kenny and uh, Kenny is like a veteran in the whole design industry, doing product and furniture and interior. Um, so he is also the founder of 11H, a uh, multidisciplinary design studio that focuses on interior and product design. Um, Kenny has two masters, one from Domo's uh, Academy and the other one from uh, the University of Wales, right? So, can you want to share anything about yourself? Hi, I'm Kenny. Uh, I run the company 11H. So, uh, I'm also teaching at the same time at uh, NTU and Tanya Academy of Fine Arts. And uh, in our company, we deal mainly with uh, interior design. We started out as a product design company doing furniture, office furniture, and then a little bit of products here and there. And uh, over the years, some of our clients have also asked us to do their showroom and their show flat, their exhibition. And then it led, led on until now, we are also doing residential interior. Yeah, so, so that's up to now, what we're doing. Cool. And then, last but not least, we have Irwanta Salim. Uh, should we call you Salim or Irwanta? What? Yeah, you can call me Salim. I think it's easier for, for in Singapore for, for to use my surname. <laughs> yes. My first name is a bit difficult <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> right. And uh, Salim has been uh, in the design education industry for over 25 years, right? Uh, managed six diploma courses, 12 certificate courses, and currently a senior manager, uh, senior course manager at ITE, the School of Design and Media. So um, he designs strategic collaborations between the education industry. I think this is a very rare kind of role um, to bridge the gap between the academia and the the schools and uh, what is needed by the industry. So really, really good to have you here. Um, so Salim had started at Tomasic Poly uh, Design School, followed by Singapore Poly, and then uh, School of Design. And then now he, uh, he actually got his master's in business design from Domo's Academy as well. So I, when I had the uh, had a pre kind of like a, a call with the different panelists, uh, I understood that they were all uh, studying at Milan and, and um, studying in overseas uh, uh, university in, in Milan uh, and then coming back to Singapore uh, to contribute, right? As far as uh, Bosami going back to Malaysia. So uh, that's kind of how they meet and how this uh, panel got formed together. So there's a very interesting group. Um, I'm going to just stop sharing my screen so that we, or rather I should just go back to this one. Yeah, sorry to um like before we continue on, yeah, um completely uh missed um introducing our moderator. So <laughs> Kat is actually um <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, Kat is actually an experienced consultant himself. So he's sort of a designer himself as well. He's been serving the design community in Singapore since um twenty eleven. So coming to ten years now that he's been um involved in the design community. Um so I thought that, you know, he 
um, asking him to moderate this session is really, uh, it really aligns really, uh, really well. Uh. And um, uh, so at, at his day job, he's um, uh, working closely with enterprises and startups and nonprofits. Um, his expertise is in um, design thinking, product management, digital strategy, user experience, right? An interesting fact about Kat, um, besides the fact that he uh, loves bad puns and dad jokes, uh, his black cat is actually named Sharpie to commemorate his um, frequent use of Sharpie markers in the design process. Yeah. So thanks, Kat, once again for agreeing to moderate. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so let's uh, go back to this and we're going to start the panel rolling. All right, so if you guys are coming through in uh, through Zoom and you have questions to ask, just feel free to put it into the chat uh, and our our moderators, oh, hooray, Shafi. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Min and Sid will help to collect those questions and then we can uh, ask them one by one. All right, so let's get the... Rolling. <laughs> I think I want to start off the first uh, question to the to all the different panelists. Is what does design mean to you, and uh, what is your definition of design? Actually, anyone? I guess the very basic of what design is is to help solve problems, right? Help solve problem. I mean, everybody has some form problem, but uh, uh, designing. And solving problems should uh, come together, and you know, at the end of the day, uh, it should make the problem, I mean, aesthetically pleasing, you know, psychologically sound. <laughs> so that's my take on what uh, design means. Uh, it's basically to solve problem for people. I, I'll just check it. Sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. This question was interesting because when uh, when I did my degree in uh, in thirty so actually that was the first day question by the lecturer. So they asked us, I say, why are you here? And they say, you know, what do you think about design? And you know, of course, everybody says that you know about aesthetics and all that. Interestingly, the answer I was given, I said, you know, do you remember you woke up this morning and then you know you you try to pick what clothing you wear? So it that 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 already constitutes design actually. <laughs> yep, that's true. Um, <clears throat> well, for me, I think uh, I I I agree with uh, Kenny and Salim. Uh, obviously, uh, first thing first, design it's always has to solve a problem, right? Um, but also, uh, for me, uh, design it's always about how it works especially when we are working as a, or we are creating something, an object. Um, I think the first thing that we need to, to ask ourselves is that why the product or the object should exist in the first place. If it exists for the right purpose, then there's an opportunity to design and there's an opportunity to solve a problem through that whatever thing that we design, as simple as toothpick, you know, as, 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 and as big as um, uh, a building. So anything has to be designed uh, according to whatever the psychological issues or the most importantly is to create a better world. And, and it's interesting um, how the way that we are seeing design and the way that how design is being perceived out in the world or you know, in, in wherever field that we, we are in, is kind of different, right? So I wanted to understand maybe from your point of view, how does others perceive the work that you do? Like, what, what do they think uh, your, your view of design is? And, and maybe from, from what you've been hearing and what you're seeing, uh, how is design being perceived in your industry? I would say, like, it depends on which, uh, who is viewing this. All right, so I... Uh, let's say if we are looking at some of these uh, young designers that's coming up, or maybe some students, or you know, then maybe they will look at design as kind of something that is like making it look very cool and you know, looking very nice and uh, you know, exciting and all. But uh, uh, of course, if you are looking at it on a client's perspective, some of the business people they they use it as a tool. They take design and they treat it like oh, this is another part of our whole strategy of doing business. You know, and some of them don't realize what design actually is, but they 
they just feel like they need to have it because everybody's having it. So they will just, oh, I need a designer coming in and then we, we so that we can brand it and then put it together, say, oh, this, our products is designed in Singapore and designed where, 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 by who and all that stuff. So that can, you know, kind of tell people that we are original and they use it, they use us as a marketing tool. Uh, so I would say it's, it's, it depends on who, you know, who is looking at what, you know, how they perceive us as a designer. So. Nice. And, and how about to boss? How is design being perceived in Malaysia? Um, well, um, the, the word design has increasingly become famous in, in Malaysia. Um, I think for the past 10 years, um, long way before that, not so many people uh, uh, saying things like uh, this thing should be designed this way or that way. Uh, it's, it's simply because um, the the new era of the like the modern society nowadays, they demanded for, obviously for, for or in, in generally, they are looking for something looks cooler, something looks uh, pleasing to their eyes. And those are the things actually designers at the back hand uh, has to solve so many things, uh, especially when we design something that is, has to be practical. For example, if you are want to build as simple as uh, objects such as chair or table, it's not just design. Uh, we have to know so many things more like uh, materials, you know, uh, costing, um, um, dimension, or how many things, or what is the MOQ to produce just one design. So in general, uh, the word design increasingly become famous uh, nowadays in Malaysia. People start to acknowledge designers. People start to understand and people start to say or start to value things that are designed well. There are places in the market and and no it it it's um validated by i would say like the success story of ikea in malaysia right just within a short space of time they are opening few more more stores it shows that the market is willing to pay for a good products uh, and involved design so i i would say like um there are, will be still different perspective on design but there are actually a long way to go to explain to all the general public on how the product should be designed. And not to say also, uh, not, not to forget that uh, a good design nowadays is not just uh, a good looking thing, but also a product that solves your daily problem. At the same time, we also need to understand that how much waste, you know, if the product didn't exist at the right place at the right time. So it becomes so much more thinking. Uh, I do believe that designers has to be educated themselves. In, it's not just to make uh, just a nice drawing, nice sketches, but we have to look forward, like how the impact will be give uh, from the manufacturing perspective or the consumers in perspective. Should they buy a product that just a want and not a needs? Mm. Salim, any uh, thoughts? Yeah. Well, interestingly, when I when I started design long time ago, <laughs> <laughs> we we are more like I do. We are, we are, I think we are more like decorators in Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, usually the, the client will come and say that you know make this thing look beautiful. <laughs> so it has it has changed a lot. I think I think for Singapore especially, I, I find that uh, design uh, has has. The perception of design changed uh, quite tremendously in the past decade. Uh, when I started, really, you know, it, it just beautifying things. But uh, subsequently, like in the, in the 90s, there's a lot of awareness that you know how design can help in terms of uh, boosting business, uh, in terms of like how to make things, uh, you know, something that people will want rather than you know like uh, yeah okay you you come at the end of the whole process and you know just make it look nice nowadays designers tend to be involved from the beginning uh so that's why uh a lot of uh, a lot of things like for example what i learned uh, in, in in doing business design is that you know we, we we have to be involved from the beginning uh we have to know exactly what the client wants uh, at the end and we have to actually suggest to them like uh, what is the best way for them to achieve it at the end. So design has grown quite, 
quite a lot at times, you know. So we were not just looking fun things anymore now. Right. So so it, it seems like what we can hear is that whole maturity level of design has definitely shifted uh, over the years. And just curious, how, how does that affect the way that you have been designing your course curriculum uh, from the education perspective, right? Yeah. Oh, designing, the designing course curriculum is totally different thing. Uh, again, you know, like uh, I, I use my, my, my background, especially in, in business designing. Uh, the problem that we find in education typically is actually about the field of innovation. Uh, somehow, I think, uh, you know, because the startup cost to do a course is quite expensive. Uh, so generally, there is a fear of, uh, you know, starting something that is unknown. Uh -huh. So uh, there is a lot of study and then, you know, like uh, you have to study a lot of the figures and then after that, you have to analyze this, analyze that. But I think one of the issues that I found recently is that, you know, uh, by doing that, uh, we are left behind a lot of times because the world has moved so fast that any cost development that takes more than six months is too slow already. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's just the world has changed. Yeah. And, and then maybe to Kenny, because I understand that Kenny also teaches in NAFA and NTU, right? So yes. when it comes to like, teaching how is, is the curriculum has it been changing over the years or yeah yeah of course I, I mean it's evolving all the time and uh, what we try to do is uh, kind of incorporate a little bit of practical skills many times uh, uh, we are not just going to teach them things that you know in theory but uh, what we bring in as a part-time lecturers right is is how how the industry works and how we can help the student to be able to adapt to those uh, those that's working outside, right? So the business outside and, and the teaching in the school, sometimes a little bit different because, of course, three years in school doesn't cover everything. So what the school will try and do is give you a lot of uh, theory-based uh, theory uh, concept development and all that stuff. But when you come out to the working world, it's a lot about solving problems and then just doing it. And many times it, you can, it, can, it can feel kind of mundane, right? But uh, you need to align that kind of uh, some, some form of misconception there, right? Because the student will get very disillusioned if you don't bring them some of, bring in some of these items into it. So we, we try and, and bring in some of this practical stuff in so that they, 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 can, they, they can get a feel of this. And I think one of the good things is, is happening now is also the internship program. Mm. A lot of the schools are now going out with this internship program. There's not just one month, two months, you know, but six months, nine months. And those kind of program is, is really good because I feel the student really get an opportunity to, you know, study from and have the kind of mentorship with, with a design company, design firm. Then at the same time, the, the design firm, you know, get to also meet some of these uh, graduating designers, right? So for us, it's like we can get to experience them, have a little bit of a relationship, train them up. And of course, because of this internship, the fees are not so high. So we don't take in full timers and, you know, so with, uh, with this kind of program running, it, it's, it's really good to kind of align the industry with the teaching. I think that, that kind of is working around that now. Yeah. All right. And, and maybe, uh, shifting the gear later to uh, the the commercial work that you do, right? How has that changed over the years in terms of what your clients are asking you uh, to deliver in terms of like projects and and uh, ha has the brief changed um, or mature? I think I think it has changed for me. Uh, but I'm not so sure whether is it because uh, because of the industry or because of uh, what we have become over the years, right? So so if uh, if when uh, we first start out and we are taking on jobs and all that stuff, uh, a lot of time. Mm, 
I guess there's some change. A lot of time, the, the companies are not so aware of what, uh, what the design encompasses and how they can, how we as designers can help them. But they know that they just want to have somebody inside there, right? So, but so, but now I think a lot of the design, uh, uh, all the companies that are engaging or really rather meeting up with us, uh, they already know a certain. They have already a certain sense of what design means, and they tend to give some kind of autonomy to to us as designers, you know. So, so they 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 respect us a little bit more <laughs> in our industry. Yeah, you you used to like you know they just say oh we need this you just do it you know and you yeah but but over the years you get clients that oh they they really uh, need your help. And they are, you know, kind of like, oh, putting, putting in their all and really hope that you, you help them turn around their business. Yeah, so that, that's, that's some of the things that, you know, that, that, and they, they, will, they will, I mean, they will listen to all the advices. And then we, we will, of course, uh, on our side, we, it's a heavy responsibility because, uh, because it's, it's somebody's livelihood, right? Everybody's working towards that. So, so. Whenever I do a job, I, I take it as I'm part of the company. Uh, I don't just here come here, take the money, and then you know do whatever I want and, and then get out. But I, I will once I take on this responsibility, it's it's part of my my job as as part of the team in the company to help them solve the problem. Okay. Whatever whatever you know money that we agree on is not important. Really. We just do it. That's all. Yeah. Maybe. maybe. To Bostami, how, how is this similar and different to the work that you do? Because yours is watch design, uh, right? I mean, running your, your own bespoke watch design uh, business. How is this different? All right. Um, so the way, we, the way we design our business strategy, it com- encompassing with the design uh, ecosystem all together within the keywords of collaborations. Okay. Um, there are thousands of brands uh, for, for watch company, right? So, and we are pretty, pretty much a, a young company. We are just three years in the industry. And what, what we did for this startup is that, uh, uh, honestly speaking, it was so hard to penetrate the market even though there are millions of people, but then there are also thousands of brands that you need to compete. And all these companies, are, they are like uh, deep pockets. Okay? So what we did, we, we did a really small team. You know, we believe that we have the expertise of designing, which is that our superpower. And that, that's, that's the thing that we, we feel gratitude for. So uh, in order to be seen in the market, okay, we need to understand the, the whole ecosystem of how people perceive or how people value every product that they are going to purchase. Okay. And as for the watches, it's actually it's not that hard simply because they are people are looking to see the time all the time. So they need something to see. Even though they are smart watch and as you have your, your smartphone and stuff, but then um, there are still people who value something that are wearable. Okay. And what makes um, we and how we we try to to tell the, the world that we are in this uh, business but then why we are so different compared to others is that because we offering something that many companies that cannot offer which is customization or we call it bespoke okay so in order for us to go into the market uh, the i think the the even now or coming future is that you don't want to compete with anyone because for us, it's almost impossible to, comp- to compete with Swatch, uh, to compete with Tech Hoyer, all those kind of brands. So the best thing is that is to stick to your strategy if you have something you are working on. You have to believe in your team and your expertise. So that's what we did. When I say the word collaboration, is that we are looking for a entity or the other partner who are looking for an object for their, for example, community or fan base which is if we look in the business perspective or marketing wise, um, considering now we have an, a, a pond, like a lake, 
and then there are bigger lakes and we are going fishing into a slightly smaller lakes which is the big company doesn't want to get into so mm. it, it, it gives us a competitive advantage already because nobody wants to go there yeah. and we, when with our offering which is the customization you know the the this the, we are designing it from scratch we're giving their superpower to to have what kind of watches they want and then our unique preference is that we are only making it limited edition so we we find out that working out with the artists so i was uh very passionate into arts our teams our team too and since day one when we are opening our our company we start collaborating with the painter you know the the graffiti artists so we offering them to draw on that watches which is now um there are company doing that but they are like a super expensive brand like uh, patek philip hablo which is mm. 500 000 usd kind of watches but us is still like a below 1000 uh sing dollar i would say so we have that customization then this type of artists or, or, or they, they already have their own fan base fan base so that's where my point coming to the fishing in the slightly smaller pond or lake and then uh within that we actually start uh, looking for a, a bigger audience in terms of artists so we have artists from new york from germany from japan uh from russia uh basically all over the continent then that what makes our company is international since day one uh, singapore we haven't yet uh, found yet so maybe we are looking after this um And then within that business model, it gains so much trust to a bigger player. Bigger player, I mean like a, a bigger singer, artist. So they are start looking for us. Oh, you guys can do customization. I I wanted to do that because we have a fan base. Normally, we just sell a, a T-shirt, for example, right? So watches, it's kind of premium. So they are looking into that. Then we start collaborating with like a legendary artist in Malaysia, like M Nasir, and we have rock bands such as Butterfingers. Mm. And we have more coming, uh, and we are going to announce soon our biggest collaboration. Uh, hopefully by end of this uh, week, we we are doing the Prime Minister series limited edition for Malaysia. So along the way, it grows up so fast, and and the business model so far works. And and by the time the artist say, "Hey, I'm making a watch," just you guys can take a look in artist.co website. And for the most part, within 24 hours, our watches is all sold out. Then. Thank God for that. Then, then we start try start to making, and we are getting more requests. So, um, basically, uh, my point here is that design is not just um, to create something for something. Because if you are try to sell design alone, it's super hard. Trust me. And this this is modern world, and this is happen. If you know, um, I believe you all know Tesla. Like, and they are, they also have many competitors. Uh, for example, they have Fisker and other. Another electric company, whereby um, it's super hard for Fisker to penetrate the market simply because they are focusing so much on the design, and design should complement all other things around us. That's why the collaboration is the keyword in this modern world. Right, cool, and and I think we have a question from the from the chat uh, from Isabel. That I probably just want to bring in uh, the conversation as well. Um. What are your experiences? I mean, to all the three different panelists, right? Working freelance, if you have, or you're running your own business, since uh, Kenny and Bostami has been running their own uh, business as well. So, what challenges um, did you face, and what do you like about them? What advice do you give to someone who are about who who is actually thinking about uh, freelancing? Right. Maybe I mean, there's a uh, different layers of uh, questions here, but. but Perhaps let's start with challenges, right? No, uh, Kenny, where do you start? Challenges between running your own company and run doing freelance, is it? Uh, I I guess maybe limit to challenges in uh, uh running your own practice and still have to uh the the projects or or even teaching, uh, or you know the different aspects of of your life. Okay, so I, I think well, when I first uh, before I started uh, my own company, when I was still working for people, uh, I started because I I already planned to at the end of the day run my own business. So the first thing I wanted to do was start getting jobs. 
So I, I started off doing freelance while I'm working. Mm. All right. So so that that kind of uh, you know. So I, I I wanted to know what is the business aspect of doing things like costing, you know, meeting up, showing presentation, and all that stuff. When you're working for a company, of course, it's a little bit different. We have our own internal meet, and then we we discuss, and then we you know it's quite straightforward. You don't have to go in really. You have to convince, but you it's not it's it's a different type of convincing. Well, uh, so when you you start. Uh, doing this freelance business, right? First of all, you are uh, because you are freelance. I, I think sometimes we get abused a little bit, right? Because uh, they 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 see that you are, you are, you are abu- you are you're freelancer, so you can do cheaper. You can you know do whatever, right? So so we, uh, but the thing is, it's 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 mutual. It's okay because we are trying to get experience, right? Yeah. So money shouldn't be the main problem. Um, shouldn't be the main issue. The main issue is getting the job, doing it, and then making it successful, learning through the job. So I, I would tell people that take on freelancing job. Yeah, do it. Do it and, uh, and, and, and gain the experience because you need the experience. Mm. If you've got no experience, you can't do any work. Don't talk about money. Right? So, so uh, do the freelance and then you learn from, the, from, do, learn from it and, and then build up the portfolio. Build up the portfolio because your clients, your new clients coming in, will want to see the portfolio. What you have done, how you have done it, you know, how do you execute the job and all that stuff, and then and then build that knowledge. Build that knowledge such that you know the different industry. How do you manufacture things? How do you make things happen? You know, who do you know to get things done for you? So these are all connecting the all the dots for you to you know have a very complete. Uh, complete professional kind of uh, design base. Huh? Mm. Right? In school, you don't, they don't teach you all this. So this, these are all things that you, you have to do. So as a freelancer, you do those things. So, so yeah. the way that we should see freelance is not so much of, uh, to the client, they see like free work, but for us, you should see it as free learning experience. La. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I mean, don't, don't uh, I mean, we, we don't want to say until it's totally free. We don't get anything out of it. <laughs> I mean, if you know that your clients are out to abuse you, you can decide to walk away, right? Because as a freelancer, we, we still have our salary to pick up. I mean, yeah. when I was working for a company, I still have money. So, uh, you know, it's not important. You, I don't like you, I don't do the job, yeah. right? But then now you are doing the business. You set up your own business. It's a little bit more different because now it's not about supporting yourself. You have to learn how to pay rent, pay the staff rent uh, salary, yeah. You know, every month you worry about all those kind of things. So, so that that is the little bit of difference as a freelancer and as a as a, a full fledged uh, design company. Yeah. And and you need you need to make the business uh, work in a yeah. way, right? So that's therefore the costing and all that stuff is a lot more different. And you you have to go and chase after the job. Maybe to Salim, has a lot of your students actually want to. Say hey, uh, uh, after graduating, I'm gonna like go freelance and uh, I'm gonna start my own practice. Um, what, what is the situation on your end? This is actually quite uh, quite common now, actually, because uh, what 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 I find is that if you can actually mingle them, uh, that means like a competent different discipline. So for example, like uh, if you're from the media side, you know, like from video, uh, then after that you mix them up with uh, interactive. Or from graphic design, somehow organically when they go out, uh, they might form a company actually. Mm. <laughs> Interestingly, <clears throat> uh, for freelance, uh, freelance is a very uh, yeah challenging thing for any any student I find. Uh, so at one point in, in Singapore Poly, actually I went to collaborate with one of my colleagues. Uh, we actually set up a, like a design studio uh, in uh, on campus. And the, the job is actually to take in you know, a lot of this uh, revenue generating work uh, just to get the students get a feel of how they can actually start charging. Because a lot of time what I found is that uh, the students got cheated. So by the time they come to me and then they say, oh, you know, I just got cheated, you know, I took on the project and then, you know, the, the client just gone away, you know. Too late. Well, I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think by then, I said, well, I think there's nothing what you can do, just learn from it. Uh, but again, you know, like, uh, they, they, so, so, so freelance, I think it's a, it's a good start. But they must know that, you know, there is certain risk to it. Yeah. So 
So for, for companies, uh, I find that in Singapore, the overhead is the, one of the killer I find. If you grow too fast, uh, I have seen my students who grow too fast. It means that they, 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 gen, they, they wanted to take in a lot more clients. They tend to be unable to balance that. Uh, interestingly, some of them will lose their home, so called. You know, so, so they become, uh, you know, they, they, they're just doing for, to earn money. And the then they say, oh, the you know, I, yeah, so I, I hate to do this anymore, you know, because, you know, I lost my soul. So, so I think the, the, the good one that I saw from a couple of my students, they know how to balance. So let's say they have taken a lot of uh, good paying jobs. So mm. they, they call it bad butter, they call it. And then after that, uh, they, they act on their own. They actually do their own project. So let's say it's, uh, I, I know one graphic design uh, student who actually run a very successful company on his own. And, uh, you know, he employed maybe like one or two uh, young designers. But on his own, uh, he does a lot of furniture designing. Somehow, you know, it is something that he wanted to do. So they, he said, so, you know, I, I, I can do my bread and butter, but at the same time, I just do what I want. You know, so that they can balance up in terms of, uh, you know, it's good for your soul. <laughs> <laughs> Sanity. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that we, I did when I was as a freelancer, right? Uh, you know, sometimes you, you do the office work, it's, it's quite mundane. Then you put on this freelance job, it's like a breath of fresh air. You do something new, something, you know, that you're interested in. So you do it for less money, it's okay because anyway, that's fun, you know. When you say office work, is it the office furniture uh, or office uh, kind of design or oh no no I mean as in like yeah, when we were employed as a full timer right, right, in, right, right, right. in the company so then either I'm doing office furniture or I'm designing contract furnishing or whatever yeah, yeah after a while you can you know a lot of technicalities you're you're doing numbers you're meeting clients you're not really doing the work you know? mm. and yeah the design work sometimes comes in like that and it's like oh wow, that's quite nice you know do it right. <laughs> and how about for Bosami like when you return back from uh, Milan, do you like started as like doing freelance or do you went straight into uh, starting the, the watch company? Um, so it was a long journey after I come back. I, after I come back uh, from Milan to Malaysia and I didn't straight away um, uh, open a watch company. That, that company is, still, uh, is just recently, about two years ago, we started. Um, I come back to Malaysia in 2020 10, so it was like 10 years ago. It quite, uh-huh. It's been quite a while. Um, but then uh, to find a job during that time, it was so hard. Okay, and, and I, I graduated in Master Car and Transportation Design. Even though doing project with Lamborghini, there's only two companies in Malaysia. <laughs> you know? And then they, they're always full of uh, designers in those companies. Uh-huh. So when I come back, even though I got the uh, opportunity for, for them asking me to send my resume and kind of stuff, but then I didn't get admitted right away. So after six months of trying, then only I get admitted to Proton. You know, um, they are looking for a designer, but then in, in big company, they are, they, they all, they always having a budget, you know, like uh, when one person leave, then only they can afford to hire a new one. So mm-hmm. that happened to me when that person leave, then I only got the opportunity, but then they know and I know we've been waiting for six months to get on board. Mm. So that was my contribution to, to Malaysian car company. So I worked in Proton for, I think, almost five years. And um, the freelance team, uh, this is an advice for people who are doing freelance because freelance is not consistent, right? You get a job and sometimes those are, those are, there are so many challenges, especially dealing with clients. And when you are dealing with clients that has low perspective in terms of how design can bring value to them and that's how so many so many stories we heard that uh, you got cheated by this and that so uh, I've been doing freelance uh, the whole of my life even now I still got uh, like a uh, offer to do this kind of little, little projects so my advice to people who are interested uh, going for freelancing but at the same time also thinking about opening a business this is really two different side of story because freelancing you are on your own okay you are on your own you i understand many people come into the design world because they feel very passionate they love the design they love how things works they love how cool is that product but those are the things doesn't pay you a bills 
Okay, we, we still have to pay rent and food and stuff, so many things. So my advice would be you, you in the first place, you have to invest your time and energy to yourself. Make sure you are so good in what you do and people will come to you. So instead of you looking for a job, let the company come to you. And when they come to you, you set your own term because they come to you, right? So you can have, uh, normally what I do, um, we always have a contract in the beginning before I even sketch or I even start opening my Photoshop. So have a contract. Uh, there's a lot of example in the t internet or you, if you have like a law friends or legal kind of thing, you can ask them uh, validating your contracts and make sure you guys both happy, you and your client, happy with that contract of what the amount, time and stuff, then only you sign off. After you sign off, for the most part, I will always ask for an upfront payment. Okay, upfront payment that you are feel comfortable and they also feel comfortable to pay you. Then only you start. Don't do it first and you send it. Hmm. Uh, they, they, they're setting like crazy deadline for you, then yeah. you're doing all the modifications. And when you send it and they say, okay, hang on now, we wait uh, for maybe my boss will approve your, our account now, uh, calculating the money, then you wait, you wait for one month, two months, three months. And at the end of the day, it, it's a loss and, and, and we have to protect our value. So that's for freelancing and for the business, you have to have like a different mindset of thinking because when you are doing businesses, you cannot grow alone. Okay, you have to have like a, at least a small team to support you. Uh, I like the story that uh, Mr. Salim said just now. Uh, when they got so many jobs and sometimes because we only have 24 four hours a day, then we sleep 10 hours a day, we play with Netflix and kind of stuff. We lost so many times to, to focus on the project. So if you're thinking about the business, then start opening a small company first. And when you get a job, make sure you are acting like you are a big company. Okay, and then when you get a job, you don't do everything yourself. If you are a business, then this is the, should be the mindset. If you are freelancing, then it's fine. When you are thinking about a business, when you get a job, please, please share some whatever salary or fees or income that you get to your friends or, or other designers because um, try to put into different perspective because I, what I believe is that the more you give, normally the more will come back to you, right? Even though you got little, little project, but then your portfolio is growing. So your company profile get more trusted in industry and people don't play, play with you because you got this client A, B, C, right? So that's, that's my take who, or people who want to go to freelancing and businesses. It's, it's like, uh, it, it's very challenging, right? But then um, you got to find a mentor too, like uh, people who are success. If you're in Singapore, then look forward to Mr. Kenny Hong or Mr. Salim. Uh, they can advise you because having a mentor is like the most important of success in any kind of, of uh, venture. It's simply because um, they will show you how, they will show you the path. Um, i give you an example, like uh, if you want to go to Mount Everest, right? You, you just don't want to like uh, blindly go there and, and climb. You need someone to bring you a shepherd to bring you to show the, the right path. Mm. So, so that's going be my advice. Cool. Thanks. A oh, lot of uh, good anecdotes there. I, I think there's, a, there's an interesting um, follow-up question, right? Um, how does one draw the line with existing customers once enough experience has been gained? I think this is to justify the price increase or do customers generally agree that once they see the added value that you're able to provide, then uh, you, you're able to, to increase the price. I think this is more to like, let's say, during when you're freelance, maybe you charge like, okay, uh, I don't know, $30 an hour, for example, right? But after that, you start a business uh, and then you say, oh, it's going to be $100 an hour now or it's $150 an hour now, right? Uh, how do them, I think this question probably to synthesize it better, more to justify justifying the value that you provide as a designer um, to the client right uh that you work with how how, how can one <clears throat> sort of justify that value <laughs> so i mean if, if i look at it uh we are counting uh, we are trying to charge based on per hour basis and that's the very basic of uh, thinking but I'm, I'm thinking like if you want to do a business you don't charge by the per hour 
you charge by the value that you create. All right, so how much is your design work uh, uh, to the client? Right, how much am I giving in terms of uh, whatever things I do? Maybe I can take a week, maybe I can take two weeks to do it, but if I can help the company increase the sales by another 10%, Right, so if they say, "Oh, my turnover a year is two million dollars, three million dollars," if I do a ten percent increase, it means I they get a two hundred thousand dollar more. So if two hundred thousand dollar more, then if you pay a twenty thousand, that's a ten percent. That's not much. If I can help you to do two hundred thousand dollars, then I think a twenty thousand dollar job that uh, that uh, only encompass two weeks job. If you charge by per hour basis, let's say $100 per day, uh, uh, per hour, then your two weeks job is definitely less than $10,000, right? So, so it depends on what kind of value do you bring to the clients, right? right? So of course there are some clients, I mean, uh, if you are starting out, of course, then you, and you have no idea how, you know, and you meet with clients that are, that, that do not have such a big budget and they are not talking about so much money or whatever, then you use the per hour gauge to kind of roughly, you know, get a feel of how much time you spend and how much cost involved but based on your per hour charge. Then after you do a little markup and can get that cost. Right. right. How, how, how does Salim <clears throat> teach your students about pricing? Generally, in Singapore, I mean, like, uh, they, they charge by a project so they, they always take a lump sum value and then they say okay this is the amount that i'm going to charge you uh i think the problem i think i can i can see from here is that you know when when you started you know you thought ah, okay i think uh, for this job i'll just charge two thousand dollars and then uh, then subsequently you know you're beginning to produce more work and then you mm. get more good you know two thousand is not enough to cover me anymore uh generally i think i always mm. advise students to start with a uh, uh, man hour first uh, after man hours, then after that they can start the, when they are more comfortable in uh, in, in sizing up you know the value of the project, and now they can actually charge by per project in the top, you know like the what kind of value that you think that you will return to the to the business. Uh, there are another another um, uh, permutation to that. Uh, one is by per hour, uh, man hours plus royalty. But it, 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 it's it's thousand factors in, in Singapore, but I think in Europe they do that some for some designers. Yeah, so so in, in this case, it says got also the uh, the designers in the sense that you know like uh, if the product is selling very very well, uh, they also get some money out of it. Other than you know like uh, oh yeah okay you paid me, it doesn't belong to me anymore. So sort of like, like Singapore is very rare. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Mm. Yeah, we, we, for us we do get this uh, kind of a royalty basis thing. So uh, it depends on client to client, yeah. But uh, for for furniture, usually we will do. Uh, we will tell the client beforehand that uh, we do charge a fee plus a royalty, and the royalty can range from three to five percent, depending. Yeah. And and I I I think there's there's a lot of uh, questions that started to to uh, stroll in and. We have about five minutes left, so <laughs> I'm gonna shift a gear a little, right? Uh, to more on. Let me see this little question, which is quite interesting. Uh, right, Awin was asking, like for example, budding software engineers can contribute to open source, uh, kind of like projects to gain experience, right? But for designers, I think when we are all just coming out into the industry or graduated and all that, how other than freelancing, uh, where do you see designers being able to contribute to sort of like a open source or something like a community kind of uh, work? Sort of to be able to gain experiences. Uh, uh, have you all seen any equivalence in, in your respective field? I see in the forum, is it? In terms like, of product design and all this stuff, yeah, it could be, yeah. No, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not really involved in all this uh, forum thing, so I'm mm. not so sure. Old school, old school, uh. <laughs> Meet people <laughs> face to face. <laughs> Meet people face to face, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. I, I think almost like in the design is a lot of relationship and network, 
uh, that we sort of build and, and use that as a way to uh, gain the necessary experience. Yeah, yeah. It's important to to have the kind of communicative skill, and so that you can you can get the opportunity. If you just stay at home and wait for people to kind of knock on doors, nobody's gonna find you. <laughs> Anything from Bosami's side? Um. Well. Um. To gain experience through collaborating in community, I think um, to put into perspective is that um, we want us to be seen, okay? And 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 we do understand that it's not easy for us to just get the client right away, and and because obviously people don't see it yet what we can bring or how we can upgrade the value of the uh, businesses or, or community. So I always um, um, encourage people to give, um, I, will, I, will, I will not say free services, but then you can do something that you are strongly believe in or you like it a lot without having a pay upfront, but not for them. But that in generally, you are showing them, say, Hey, today I'm doing this, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to tell everything. You just need to tease them that you are capable of doing this. Then you can shout out, like say, uh, anybody from software engineering or electronic people would like to join me to work on this project. So by doing that, um, you actually in a way of forming your own venture and without having a cost in the beginning because the cost will be your time your energy and your expertise and same goes to the other part that they have like the expertise in software that you don't have for example then you can partners you can collaborate and ends up you can open your own startup for example and go for funding go for pitching go to the startup incubator for example or accelerator i think singapore has done a very good thing for that you can go to GovTech, show your idea first but you don't have to show everything because it takes a lot of more time and energy. Energy, when sometimes feel that the, the the thing that you make has so much value in solving uh, community issues, for example, there will be someone somewhere will come to you and ask, "What do you need more?" Okay, I come up to a few ventures uh, with this kind of idea simply because um, I I spend a lot of my time networking. I went to this kind of event, this kind of event, even though that event doesn't belong, doesn't relate to my skills. But then I see the value in networking. When I went to the like a uh, um, startup uh, event in Malaysia, right? Um, I met with a lot of people who has so good in certain expertise that I don't have. Then we, we start becoming a friends. Then we start in the community. Uh, the thing is uh, the million build this uh, telegram group, which is so good actually for you guys to networking, to talk to each other, uh, share some knowledge, but you never know, you will might, might find someone that has the same, because finding the right business partner also, it's another challenging because you don't know uh, things going to happen, uh, right? Business is, is I would say it's difficult, but then if you lead so much the process, then you will value it so much. I treat my business as my baby. I treat my even small sketch or whatever product that I'm working on, I treat it as a baby and I want to see that baby grows. So that kind of mission that this kind of community can get you into. Right. So that's my thought. Cool. <clears throat> um, I, I wanted to re regroup back because uh, it's, it's four o'clock and I think that is one area that I'd like to link back uh, this whole conversation to, right? Is that... Uh, all three of you, and including me, um, chose to study overseas and in the master's program that is in Milan. Uh, why? And, and why not something in Singapore and why not something in the region, for example? Is there a gap here that we are seeing? Anyone? <laughs> so the reason why I wanted to do an overseas program rather than a local one is I feel the it's not about the education mainly is the interaction with the people. Yeah, the more you, you, you meet a lot of uh, people from different countries with different kind of cultural background and and thinking. And I think that that 
is the interesting thing about doing an overseas program. Mm. And second thing, of course, is uh, when you're overseas, you get to travel, you get to see a lot more things. <laughs> <laughs> you get to have the fun there. So, so I think I think for me, that's the reason, main reason why I wanted to, you know, somewhere really far away, and even you know something like language I don't understand, I I can't speak. And <laughs> just I, to experience I, the whole culture. Yeah, just the experience actually. of meeting with all these all the people. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the beauty of it. Salim. Uh, okay. I think I think for for, for me. Uh, would you, would you no, encourage <laughs> encourage your own students to go overseas? Or is oh, yeah, I do actually. Uh, actually, I do because uh, the, the 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 I think the insight that they will get when they when they get out there is very different. Uh, I mean, I mean for for me it was strange because for me I was Indonesian. I come to Singapore to study, and then I went to Australia, and then I went to Milan. So, uh, you know, the, even the culture alone, I think they it tells you a lot. Uh, what I need, mean, for example, like Milan, I think it's the openness. Uh, Italians tend to, you know, uh, entertain a lot of crazy ideas. I mean, uh, I mean, like uh, one of the crazy ideas that I did when 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 I was there is my my own thesis, which is quite uh, suicidal. Uh, I said, you know, Singapore at that time is, uh, I, I, I said, you know, Singapore is a, it's a, it's a, it's an artificial world. Let's put it that way. Everything we do, we built it ourselves. Uh, we created, including the water. So I said, why not? In say Singaporeans think that the history is not great, why not we create our own history? That is, we invent our own civilization in the past, you know, just, just to attract tourists. So, you know, the Italian was like, hey, oh, yeah, okay, you know, it, it sounds crazy, you know, maybe we should, we should look into it. You know, when I come to Singapore, hey, why do you want to do something like that? <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's interesting. But in Singapore right now, uh, again, you know, like I, I mentioned earlier, I think they, they, they start to change a lot. I mean, they, we, we do talk about things like this to certain people, you know, but uh, in education, still not that. <laughs> in education, still, you still know, very you, you safe. Have, yeah, you can't you can't go well yet. Yeah, yeah, and and do you, like I mean, just curious. I like, do do you all see that as a kind of like a common cultural mindset for whether is it in Singapore and in in Malaysia, in terms of like oh let's design and let's keep it very safe. Let's just ensure that it works and and that's it, right? Um, the the breakthroughs and all that the innovation is not not there. Well, um, I think. For me personally, um, I was, I guess it started when I was really young, uh, when I saw that supercar on TV. And and uh, since I was a kampung boy, you know, I, I live far away from, about three hours from, from uh, Kuala Lumpur. And to design a car, it's become like my dream since I was a kid, I even had a book that I wrote what I wanted to be when I grown up. And one of them is that I want to design for Ferrari. So I wrote that when I was 15 years old. And then um, somehow they say that when you wrote something on your book, uh, it translates into an energy. And subcon your subconscious mind will work for that. So fast forward 2008, uh, I got the opportunity to go to Italy. And actually, uh, what I want to say why I choose Milan uh, uh, to further my study, it's related very much, the majority decision is because of my passion. And I wanted to design something world-class, then I have, uh, and I must learn some uh, from world-class people or world-class company, world-class brand. That's makes, uh, that, that's why, how I, I end up in Italy. Then, um, because of that passion, I have another passion, which is aerospace. And uh, those are the things I'm working on right now for the space transportation systems. And those are the skills that I am leveraging onto because car design was something, uh, uh, transportation, right? So, uh, and I'm done with that. Uh, I've been in, in almost 15 years in car design industry. Then I was thinking, I was thinking like uh, how long more I should design just cars. I wanted to design something else. And, and the most highest probably engineering or something really crazy is some aerospace, right? So that's how it ends up that I ventured into another startup. It's the same business model or same uh, idea that I gave early in the community. So I went into this startup uh, where they are working out on, the, basically they are engineers, they don't have designers. 
Prize. So that's where my value came in in this startup, where we went on for the Google Luna X Prize competition uh, to land a spacecraft to the moon. So I was part of the team. And it makes me travel too. So uh, I had the opportunity to visit the R&D, uh, SpaceX R&D in the United States. Uh, I went to Google Luna X Prize in, in, in uh, California. So I think when you want to decide, de decide where you want to go, especially in terms of out of country, out of Malaysia, out of uh, Singapore, uh, you, you might want to do your research. Where is the best uh, expert that, decide on that country. If you want to go for startup tech, so you can start in Singapore, but then uh, look forward for the other country who are doing really well, for example, Silicon Valley, right? So I think the majority of decision is relies on, of course, the food is very fantastic in Italy. Um, yeah, the, the language that we, we must learn because they don't speak much English, which is now is an add-on to my language skills. So I always look forward on how many value I can get back with that kind of uh, energy and time and of course money spent during that time. Nice. Now, probably uh, in conscious of time because it's, it's uh, 4 7 now, uh, I just want to end off with one last question, right? Which is for anyone who wants to get into design, um, you know, these days we have like our boot camps as like your, your three months or six months or even some one year kind of a specialist diploma um, and, and <clears throat> comparing to a formal training, right? Like going through, what is it, NAFA or your uh, IT or, or, or the polytechnics uh, or even universities. Um, what would you advise people which route that they could take or should take? And... And yeah, and which one kind of like you feel is the probably the effective route into the industry? I'll just answer that. I think I think formal education is good to start you up with the, uh, the your your the, the, the skill. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's how much you push yourself. Uh, generally, I always tell students. I say I know you know the your your, your given time for project. But uh, always push your the project to the max. Means that anything you see with with, with projects in school, you can always make mistakes, and also you can actually push to the boundaries. You know, like you, you never worry like how much this project gonna cost me. But you know, like it, it's limitless. Basically, I can do anything. So always push it until you know you have very very good uh, portfolio, and then after that you know get out. Uh, I would suggest that either you do freelance. Once you do freelance uh, for a while, and then you branch out to open your own uh, your own uh, agency, then in this case, then you know you, you will gain satisfaction in terms of like you know your 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 own boss. I think uh, working for people is good uh, for portfolio, but at some point, I think you start asking yourself, you know, what do you achieve? Yeah. Cool. Kenny. Uh, I think definitely they if they can afford it is to go and do a formal education. And, but I always tell my student that, you know, you just need to start off with a basic. If you are starting out, don't go until a master and all that stuff. Why? Why? Because if you are too highly qualified and you're starting on a junior position, nobody there to employ you. Because they know that if I keep pay you too low, you won't stay long. If I pay you too high, you may not be productive for me. So I always tell them, say, go out after you do your diploma or, or if, you, if you're doing degree, come out, look for a job first. Get a, you know, get a good dose of what the work is all about. And you, you ask yourself whether is this something that you really like and you really enjoy. If you really enjoy and you think this is going to be a career for yourself, then go all out and do it. After that, you build your degree, do your master's, and then you want to do a PhD, go ahead and do it, right? So that will help you to, you know, help form a better position of what you want to do because some people may not even know what they really want. After they graduate with a master's and then they do some, some of these works and then it's like, oh, wow, this is not really what I signed up for. So it, it's going to be a, a choice of restarting again or you're going to leave your life regretting everything. So I always tell them go and work, get a few of what work is like. Then after from there, uh, yeah. 
<coughs> cool. Boss? Um, okay, uh, I like to share uh, two stories. Basically, it happens to to, uh, to me. And uh, this one story is that um, if you... Uh, proper education, obviously, it's essential for anyone of us in, to, to take this job professionally. Because you, you need to educate yourself, right? Uh, you need to get the right skill sets. But then, moving forward is totally different game because uh, it depends on what you want to do. Sometimes, like uh, Mr. Kenny said, we, we don't know what we want uh, until we we gone through all those things. And I've seen many things happen with uh, many people too. And in fact, uh, I was, when, when I was just starting out, I didn't right away work in a big company. I just went to work in a really small company with, I think, less than two designers. I was, uh, I have my boss, which is the chief designer, and I was the only designer because my boss doesn't do the design work so much. But then, because the company is so small, I had so much close contact with the founder or the owner of the company. And the company relying so much to sell the design to the customer, whereby he himself cannot ex- explain to the customer. So wherever, whenever we have a meeting with a customer, my boss brings me and asks me to explain. And on the other side, of the positive way, I learn so much in terms of business from him, especially how, how on how to close a deal, you know, how to put the price. Those are the value things that comes to me. If you decide to go to a big company, it's also good. But then they, you are like a small chain in a one big company. So uh, the, the, the learning curve will be so much. But then you, because you will be focusing on doing just one thing, probably your job is just to, z- to design an icon for an apps forever. I know people who work in big company, uh, in, in a Ford, you know, a big company. Um, it happens that for 15 years, he just designing a sports wheel. Okay, wow. sports me for 15 years. And, and that's what also one of the reasons why I quit my automotive industry because I wanted to design something else so much more. Mm. And that's another story of... Um, um, okay, so this is like a direct information that I get from Mr. Chris Bengal. You know, he was the former chief designer for a BMW yeah, yeah. cars. So he was the one who come up with the flames facing that many companies... Uh, are following the trend right now. So this one story of his staff, uh, his name is uh, Karim Anton Habib. So he is the uh, uh, a young designer during that time uh, when when uh, Mr. Bengal found this guy. He just a really young designer, went into the big company. But then um, Chris Bengal sees so much potential in him and Chris Bengal take him out from the company for about six months and send him to a place in Italy, a very remote place, I forgot the name, just to learn calligraphy. Wow. Calligraphy. And those are the things that Steve Jobs done for a typeface interface for Apple computer. He learned calligraphy in the Reed College. And that's why we have so beautiful interface in, in Apple nowadays. And what Karin learned in, in the remote place of Italy is just to learn to perfecting the lines. Okay? So... My, my advice would be for you just get the proper education. This is also for you to get the right mentors. The right mentor is your lecturers, it's your whatever. Okay? And then be good, be kind, be humble, respect your lecturers because these are the people who are giving away so much value to you because the skill that comes to you, it will embed it in you forever. We never know sometimes uh, you will get the opportunity that you don't know. So Karin, Karin now becoming the chief designer of exterior BMW for the past few years. Now I think he already resigned. But then the legacy live forever. Whenever you see the BMW cars, you see fast line on the road. And it's there. And it's been copied. When you design something that has been copied, then you are the best. You, 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 your baby is successful. So uh, I do really hope people who just starting out, um, sometimes we don't know what might happen. And sometimes um, we change along the way. I have another friend when I was in Italy. I have another friend, uh, Italian friend. Uh, his name is Mauro. He is 39 years old. When I was there, he, he was like a 39 years old. And for the rest of us, we just like, wow, that guy is so old. Now come to learn. <laughs> right? 
that's Asian mentality, right? But it's not, that's not for him because he had to work in his own bookstore in Roma just because to find money to find to find her proper education to that school. Yeah. So what happened was during during our classes, he he turns out to become obviously the oldest uh, candidates, but then he was like the super hard working student in that class. And later that I know when we graduate, we finish, we say bye bye, ciao ciao. And then later that I know when I see his LinkedIn, he was working with Ferrari, okay. And he was working with the Ferrari, many models. And and the latest that I I had a chance to talk to him, he's now in Apple, uh, California, designing for uh, many product that probably you buy now. So that's an inspiring story. Age is design doesn't just a number. But then, if you know what you're going to do, that's the best. But if you don't know, keep looking, like just just trying out. We, we sometimes I never know I'm going to build a watch from a car from a spacecraft, but probably I'm going to build something else in the future. I never know. So we just keep looking, try to be humble, and try to give so much value to the world within the design scope. Yeah. Right. So thanks so much. Thanks everyone for your humble sharing and very very useful insights. And then. <laughs> It's a wrap. It's a wrap. All right. Uh, round of applause. Uh, to to everyone. Okay. Thanks so much for sharing. And um, Min, over back to you. Okay. Yeah. Um. Thank you, uh, everyone who came and who stayed all the way to the end of the of our first event. Um. Due to to Bostami, Kenny, Salim, uh, and especially to Kiat for all the hard work today. Um, and yeah, and thanks Sid, um, Michael, for like, with that, you have um, come to fruition today. So um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your National Day holiday. Um, yeah. See you again soon. All right, all right stay um, safe, take care everyone. Happy National Day, Singapore. Happy <laughs> <laughs> Day to you. <laughs> oh, and thank you. A shout out to Engineers SG. Recording our event today. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Bye. Bye.